Thank you all. How do Minneapolis? Good. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for bringing the nice weather so we can all sit inside. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Brian Mallory. I'd like to thank the Loft Literary Center overall. Um, it's a pretty incredible organization. And as a Chicago resident, I'm a little jealous of what you guys have in this. So I hope you're taking advantage. Most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for the error in judgment of giving me a microphone. <laughs> Suckers. Now, seriously, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the things that I love about the writing community is that it is a community. We, time to time, come together like this, not infrequently, and we chat and we share our problems and we share our secrets and we learn from each other. Uh, I can't really think of any other industry that does that, where you learn something, some secret that helps you get ahead, and you immediately give it away. I love that. How many of you guys have been to a writing conference before, either here or elsewhere? Nice. Excellent. So you all know this. Uh, for the first timers here, or at <clears throat> first timers at a conference, it's a pretty amazing experience. You're going to be able to go to these sessions, and professional writers, people who make their living, or a living, doing this, will stand up at the front of the room, and they will answer any question you have. They will reveal their professional secrets just because you ask. So I'm from Michigan, so I can say this. Piece of advice, don't get all Midwestern. Don't be all polite and sitting in the back and taking notes. Channel your inner Jersey, <laughs> all right? Interrupt, ask questions, get clarification. If you don't understand, push us. It's what we're here for. We, we are here to help. You give any of us a microphone and we will babble for hours on our own. So feel free to step in and tell us what you want to know because we're here to help you. Uh, that starts with me. I have the honor to kick this off. I thank you for that. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about how I got here and a few broad points that I think might be helpful to you. And then after that, we're getting interactive. Uh, I want to answer your questions. I want to talk about what you want to talk about. And along the way, frankly, if uh, you want any questions, any clarification, raise your hand. If I don't see you, sing out. I suppose I should tell you uh, how I ended up here. And the simple answer is I got fired. Uh, let me back up. I've been in love with stories my whole life, as I imagine many of you have. Um, there's actually a picture of me as a baby asleep on my father, who's also asleep, with a, his, the book he was reading draped across me like a blanket. So I think I got it osmotically. And I remember the moment when I learned to read. I mean, I remember it quite distinctly, the sunlight through the window and the blonde Ashley that I was madly in love with across the table. Um, and the moment when the squiggles became a code and I could understand them, they were words, and all of a sudden I could see Spot Run. That was it, man. I was hooked. Um, I have known what I wanted to do since I was four years old. Other kids wanted to be astronauts or football stars. I wanted to be an author. So armed with that incredible gift, you know, the knowledge of what I would like to do with my life, I promptly ignored it and did other things, uh, which was actually probably a good thing overall. I worked some strange jobs, uh, then moved into television, also a strange job. Uh, and eventually into advertising, where I worked for about 10 years. And I make the joke about killers and thieves, because um, it's true. <laughs> but actually, advertising was where I really began my formal training as a writer. And a couple of points that I picked up there that I think are useful whether or not you work in advertising, which I wouldn't recommend, uh, apply anyway. Number one. In advertising, you're writing something that people do not want. That's your job. You are writing the parts people actively try to avoid. They TiVo past you. They flip in a magazine. You still have to somehow find a way to hook them. And that's worth remembering when you're writing stuff that people do want. Keep that same intensity up. Make people unable to look away on something they actually enjoy, and you've got them. Number two, uh, brevity and clarity. When somebody's driving past your ad at 85 miles an hour, word choice is really important. Um, 
And following directly from that, number three, I learned that my work was just that. It's just my work. It wasn't precious. It certainly wasn't perfect. Um, it was not my heart ripped raw and bleeding and thrown on the page. They're just words, people. They're just words. And as good as you might think they are, they can be better. There's maybe three pieces of writing in the English language that couldn't be improved. And unless you think you wrote the Gettysburg Address, I would tend to say, don't be precious about it. It needs to change. It can change. But for all of that time and all the good that came out of advertising, it has a tendency to, um, to burn people out. So I was home one evening making dinner and talking to my wife about setting the building on fire. And, uh, and she suggested uh, a slightly more radical solution, which was that I quit and go do the thing I always wanted to do, go write a book. So God love her. We sat up and we talked and we shared a bottle of wine and decided I was going to do it. I was going to chase this dream. I got up the next morning, you know, with that nervous, that sort of like butterfly tingle, and I walked into work, walked into my boss's office. I said, Jerry, I got to talk to you. And he said, Marcus, we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> Swear to God. Every now and then, rare occasions, the curtains part and the machinery of the universe is revealed. I talk about a karmic kick in the ass. It was beautiful. I, I just, I, I took that and I threw myself into this thing that I'd always wanted to do. And I did all the stuff you do. I started MFA programs, two, and quit them both. Um, I read a lot of books, I talked to a lot of people, I tried all the techniques, I free wrote and I outlined and I tried literary fiction, I tried genre fiction, I wrote with a pencil and all the things that you read. But along the way, I realized that most of the advice, and there's copious amounts of advice out there, falls into two camps, two schools of thought. The first is the one that focuses on the, the protean, artistic side of writing, you know, that, that says, that writing is at once abstract and intimate, that it's so mysterious that you can't break down the process, and so personal that there's no point in trying. There's a phenomenal Hemingway quote. I love this quote. You guys have probably heard this one. There's nothing to writing. All you have to do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Great quote, right? Pretty phenomenal quote. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> I, sorry, I belong to the other school of thought, which says that this is not a gift, it's a craft. And like any craft, it can be taught and it can be learned. If you don't believe that, that's fine, but I'm not going to be able to change your mind. And frankly, you shouldn't be here. There's nothing I or anyone else can do to help you. You should be bleeding in your laptop somewhere. <laughs> The fact that it's a craft and can be taught and learned is not to suggest that anyone can do it by any means. I am all for the fact that you can do this, but I'm not gonna be self give you self-empowering twaddle that it's a simple thing. It's not, it's hard. You need to have a lifelong and abiding love of story and of words. You need to have been a reader your whole life and have read so many books that collected and stacked, they would reach dizzying heights. You need to be tireless in your dedication to improve your craft, and you need to be ruthless in analyzing your own weaknesses and fixing them. Everybody here got all that? <laughs> Sweet. Then we can move on to the part where we get our hands dirty and talk about something useful. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to water break. <clears throat> so the most common question writers are asked is where we get our ideas. And most of us have cute answers for this. Um, I, I often go with Walmart, the ideas aisle. Uh, <laughs> another good one is uh, steal them from Stephen King. The reason we have cute answers for it is we don't know. We don't know. I mean, I wish we did. I wish there was some answer. I could tell you that I spun around three times and I tapped my toe and I, you know, had a Coke and an idea came to me, but it doesn't work that way. But I've recently come to realize that what people are really asking when they're asking where we get our ideas is how do we do it? How do we take some piece of a story, because we all have some piece of a story, some idea for a story, and turn it into a story, 
You know, what, how is that leap done? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what a story actually is. And if it's not clear, I'm not meaning that in a touchy-feely way, uh, in a group hug, celery enema kind of way. <laughs> I mean tactically, usefully, what is a story? People have spent a lot of time diagnosing this and parsing the question and twiddling with the language, and there comes a point where it's not that useful. Here's what I think of as a good rule of thumb for what a story is. A story is a protagonist, it's important, a story is a protagonist put in an impossible situation that he or she then resolves. You could pick it apart and nitpick and add details and point out the things I didn't, didn't include, but it's a good rule of thumb. What it comes down to, essentially, is a story is a plot. A story is a plot. Plot is an unfashionable word in a lot of writing circles, especially MFA type circles, which may be why so few MFA writers, MFA students actually publish novels. Um, no offense, I was one, but I saw that. It's, it, these are tools, you need to learn them. What trips a lot of people up when they start writing is that they forget to have something happen. I'm not making fun, I'm really not. It's hard, I, it's where everybody starts. I did the same thing, I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. You've got some idea, you've got a great character or an intriguing situation or a, a, a clever idea, and you mistake that for a plot or, or for a book, and it's not. The key though is how do we get from that to a novel, to a story? And essentially what it comes down to is a plot is motion. So the things that I just described they're still lifes. Take the still life and make it move. A story is a movie, it's not a still life. A plot introduces stakes. It adds context. It has a sequence. It has a protagonist. That is something people often forget. It has a protagonist. Doesn't have to be a good guy, doesn't have to be a guy, doesn't have to be a human, but it has a protagonist. <clears throat> a plot is motion. So let me give you a few examples of how you might jump from one to the next. I talked about great characters and intriguing situations and clever ideas. Start with great characters. Here's a character for you. Uh, we got a, a young boy living with adoptive parents, step parents, who don't really like him. Um, he's got no real prospects and they make him sleep under the stairs for Christ's sakes. Um, and then one day he learns that he's a wizard. It's a great character, right? That's not a plot. That's a start. It's great. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> I really wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> but when I say that what people forget to do, that they forget to make things happen, forget the motion, is that that's, that's just the start. So what you have to do is say, what happens then? Well, he's got to go to wizard school. I mean, he just became a wizard. He's got to go to wizard school. And while he's there, he'll meet some friends and learn about a whole secret world. And he'll discover that there's a bad wizard out there who actually killed his parents. And worse, he's going to someday have to be the only one who can stand up to this bad wizard that's got everybody quaking. Okay, that's a plot. You can write that book. A lot of people could have written that book uh, if you had that. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's that motion. I'll give you another, uh, an intriguing situation. How many people here have read Gone Girl? Phenomenal book, right? Gone Girl. Uh, everybody who read it agree it was pretty awesome? <laughs> Inner Jersey, I like it. All right, we'll discuss that later. Um, all right, for those of you who haven't read Gone Girl, I highly recommend it. Uh, I'm sorry, your name? Mary, Mary does not, um, <laughs> which is perfectly valid. Uh, I don't want to ruin it because I really do recommend it. Um, but for those of you who have read it, you've got an intriguing situation, right? You've got a wife who has vanished, a husband who seems maybe a little clueless, but a basically good dude, um, who doesn't know where she is, and yet he's being blamed for her murder. And that's an intriguing situation. It's just a situation. What happens, what makes it a plot, is when you put that in motion. And without ruining it for those of you who haven't read it, the deeper you dig into those two and you see how many ways their reaction, interactions were not what they told you they were and, not, and that they were not who they told you they were, that's what puts it into motion. You gotta move it forward. One last example, a clever idea. There's a book coming out in July uh, that posits that starting in 1980, 
1% of the world population um, started being born savants, with savant gifts. They're otherwise completely normal human beings. They're smart, they're stupid, they're friendly, they're not. But they have these abilities. And some of them, the most powerful of them, can really upset the order of things. They can see patterns in the stock market, or they can read your darkest secrets through your body language. All right, that's a pretty cool idea, I like to think, because I made it up. Um, <laughs> and that's my book, Brilliance, that's coming out in July. And that's pretty much where I started with it. So when I say that, I, when I tell you this stuff, I want you to know that this is what I do. I'm telling you how I do it. I had that. Neat. Now what? How do I put it in motion? Because it's not a still life, it's a movie. Well, I put it in motion by saying, well, the oldest of these kids aren't kids anymore. They're 30, and they're better at everything than anyone else on the planet can hope to be. But they're also wildly outnumbered, and they're making the rest of society very, very nervous, and we're on the edge of a civil war. All right, that's, that's pretty cool. We're getting somewhere. You know what's missing from that? The like, point I keep hammering home? Protagonist. I'm still telling you a situation. Situation with motion now. So a protagonist, all right. What if the protagonist is one of these people? He's a, he's a brilliant, um, but he works for an agency that hunts those brilliants that go rogue. And now he's tracking down his own kind on the eve of a civil war in America. Now we got something, all right? So you say to yourself, fine, but those are all great ideas, especially that last one. <laughs> what if I don't have an idea? like J.K. Rowling or Gillian Flynn, or that devilishly handsome Marcus Sakey fellow. <laughs> well, here's the truth, and I'm dead sincere with this. Our ideas suck. They do, they suck. They're not new, there's no goodness to those ideas, no innate goodness. A kid with fantasies of power, uh, a marriage in trouble, a group of people afraid of another group they don't understand, these aren't great ideas at all. These ideas suck. Free yourself of the notion that you need to have a great idea. You've all heard the line, there's nothing new under the sun. You know where it's from? Ecclesiastes. <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun was the thinking more than 2,000 years ago. There's definitely nothing new under the sun today. It's not about something new under the sun. My ideas suck. Say it with me. My, My ideas, ideas suck. suck. <laughs> Better, right? It's kind of clarifying. You feel lighter. <laughs> it was such a big thing when I learned that because I just agonized. Over it. it's, it's not the ideas, it's the telling. And the telling is yours. It's entirely about the telling. All right, so we've promised ourselves to remember to have a plot. And we've promised that that plot will have motion. We've stopped looking for brilliant ideas. How do you actually, you know, write a book? Well, the answer is uh, a lot of hard work, an enormous amount of cursing, um, a fair bit of bourbon if you're so inclined, <laughs> uh, and a number of tools. A number of tools, and I say tools very consciously. They're not gifts, they are not magic, they are not fairy dust, there is no requirement to how to use them, except putting in the sweat to learn how to use them. And this weekend is basically a crash course in novelistic power tools. For me, in my not terribly humble opinion, the most important tool, <clears throat> the one that has saved me more time and frustration than any other, the one that has simplified my life and dramatically improved my writing is a true tactical understanding of story structure. Specifically, three-act story structure. How many of you have heard of three-act structure? Outstanding. Now, of those of you who put your hands up, and don't lie, how many of you really feel like you understand three-act story structure? That's about right. Uh, four or five. Look, I, I was where the rest of you were who raised your hands. I sort of kind of did, right? It's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Act one, you put somebody up a tree. Act two, you throw rocks at them. Act three, you get them down. And that's not inaccurate. 
but it's not that useful. Uh, it goes a lot further than that. <clears throat> Before I get into exactly how it works, and by the time I'm done here, everyone in this room will understand 3x story structure. And if you don't, I'm around all day, buy me a beer and we'll talk. <clears throat> Before I get into it, I want to talk about why it's such a useful tool. The reason 3x structure is such a useful tool it is, is that it is the innate way we are conditioned to hear stories. The first person to write about this was Aristotle. It's the way we expect a story to be told. It's the way your reader expects to have it come across to them. Now, whether it's central to us because it's actually wired into our DNA or it's central because most of Western civilization is based on Aristotle really doesn't matter. It's the way we expect stories to be told. And that makes it an incredibly effective tool. What it's not, and this is where people go wrong and they turn their nose up at it, what it is not is a formula. You do not plug variables in and come out with a story. It doesn't work that way. It's frankly a diagnostic tool, a little bit of a planning tool, but it's a way to think about telling a story. And it is not the only way. There have been many terrific, wonderful stories that you couldn't jam into a three-act structure with a gallon of KY and a crowbar. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. Anyone who tells you that there is one way to do this is lying to you. Anyone who tells you you have to do it their way is lying to you. I'm just telling you about a great tool that saved my ass many, many times. And the best thing about it is that whether or not you choose to use it, whether or not you choose to plan that way in advance and write it with a three-act structure, <clears throat> it will help you anyway. It will help you because when you find yourself at a point with a scene that just won't go, check your structure. When you get to the dreaded page 200 desert and you want to throw yourself <laughs> off the roof, check your structure. Your midpoint's wrong. You can use this as a diagnostic tool even if it's not what you're doing, because it is a very effective way for people to understand story structure. All right, so enough already, right? Shut up, Seiki, and get on with it. Um, I'm going to. This is the part where we start to get interactive. It's complicated at first glance. I want to talk it out. I want you to ask questions. I want you all to understand this by the time I'm done. So please step up. Channel your inner jersey. Uh, and following that, I'm done. I really want to just talk about what you want to talk about. So start thinking about that as well. All right, so someone could help me with the chart on the other side. We have charts. <laughs> I drew them myself. Yes, you can. So I think the first thing uh, that you all note from that chart is that I have terrible handwriting um, <laughs> and no skill with a marker whatsoever. The second thing, and the thing that I think confuses most people, it's certainly what confused me when I started trying to learn three-act structure, was that it's called three-act structure and there are four acts. Remember when I was talking about precision with words and everything? I mean, seriously, this might have been a good place to be a little more precise. <clears throat> there are four acts on paper. There are three for simplification purposes and because everybody likes the rules of three. People like things that have three more than four. I'm going to go talk about them in general and then go into them in a little more detail and talk about them in context of movies is usually easiest because that's something we can all see. Everybody seen Star Wars? The actual Star Wars, not the crap they made for the kiddies? <laughs> yes? Yes? Good. Uh, so, the first act inter introduces the characters, most especially the protagonist. And it introduces a situation that depends on that protagonist. Now, it might be that clear, or it might not be revealed why the protagonist is so important into it, in it until far later. But it's a situation, something is changing. Remember, stories, plot, or motion. The second act is the actual story. 
Act two is it, man. Act two of a movie, act two of a book, act two is the thing. That's where it's actually happening. It begins when the protagonist commits to their journey, and they are, they are doing this. Um, and then it follows them through their attempts to navigate this. Sometimes they're changing along the way, sometimes not. It's not mandatory. Like I said, this isn't a doctrine. Um, one thing that is generally a good idea is that the solution gets increasingly unlikely. Stakes get up, go up and up and up. That's clearly true with a crime novel or a, a mystery, but I posit it's true regardless. If you're writing a literary novel about a son trying to connect to his father, um, I would suggest that it get worse and harder and more difficult as it go along. If it just gets easier, it's a boring ass book. In the middle of the second act is the midpoint. The midpoint is crucial. The midpoint is when things change dramatically. Now, when I say use words like middle, I don't mean it has to fall exactly in the middle. All of this will shift according to your needs. It's not a doctrine. It's a way to understand storytelling. But it's what divides the first half of the second act and the second half of the second act, which I have cleverly and creatively named 2A and 2B. <laughs> that was my invention. After the midpoint, things get worse dramatically. The actions your hero, your protagonist, sorry, your protagonist has taken uh, have negative repercussions. Every small seeming victory ends up being a defeat. It introduces consequences they didn't expect. It's the period where the world is falling apart and it culminates in what, there's a lot of different names for it, but I like to call it the all is lost moment. Um, it's also called the black moment and the dark night of the soul, and clearly we're all pretty poetic about it. But it's the moment when the protagonist has really screwed everything up, and there's just no way through, no possible way through. And probably, especially if you're writing a thriller or something along those lines, a lot of other people are on the line. And their journey into this world, their decision to take this journey, is going to have dramatic consequences for all of them. They should have just stayed at home on the couch which is followed by act three, in which they shake that off, figure out a plan, and resolve the situation. Again, I don't care if they have a happy ending. That's your call. I will argue that you're going to make, have happier readers if they have a satisfying ending, which is not necessarily a happy one. A lot of the books that I really love have essentially a bittersweet ending. You won, but at cost. A lot of the books that I write have that. Uh, regardless, it should have a satisfying ending. And this isn't part of three-act structure, but it's a personal peeve of mine. Uh, for me, an ending should feel like the only ending of the book. It should feel, once you've finished the, the book, like that was the only possible way it could have come together. When I read a book and the ending just sort of happens, it feels a little tacked on, and yeah, they tied it up, that ruins the experience for me. You gotta stick your landing. That's why endings are so hard. That's usually where the bourbon comes in. It's a tough part. You bang your head against the wall. You talk to somebody else. You talk to yourself. You understand that part's hard. But strive for an ending that feels like the only possible ending to the book. Something to shoot for. All right, so everybody with me so far? You're all being very quiet and polite. Um, you know, if we look at classic mystery, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like that first act is often situation comes or if the protagonist is the main detective, the situation happens first? Oftentimes. Yeah, there's, these are not hard and fast rules. It all has a little flexibility. You need to get your protagonist introduced. In the classic mystery you're talking about, you might say, see an antagonist with their victim. You often see that as an almost prologue. You don't quite know what's going on. Then you come to the scene where it's the actual crime scene and you see the poor victim you know, in their sad state. Um, and your detectives come on scene, and maybe your detective's your protagonist. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but make sure that you do introduce your protagonist, and fairly early, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be first, but it needs to be clear to your reader who they're following. You know? There's no problem if you introduce a handful of people first, if it's a setup, you know, if you're guiding them through something that happened that's gonna give context to the book overall. But we need to know who we're following, because when we read a book, we are rooting for someone. You know, we are investing in someone. One of these people is our, at least one of these people, um, is our 
proxy. And we need to know who it is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You didn't have a hand up? OK. You did. Absolutely. Absolutely. The answer to a lot of these questions is going to be absolutely. Remember, this is not a formula. This is not a doctrine. It's a way of looking at things. Um, the trick with or the tricky part about ensemble casts um, is making them all dance and interact and keeping the reader interested. Uh, a good way in general is if there's some conflict between those people. That's why buddy cop movies exist. You know, there's never a buddy cop movie where the two guys are just great and get along and it's awesome and let's go solve this crime. Um, you have them battling in some way. It, you can have one. I wrote a book called The Amateurs, which is about four friends. It's four equal protagonists um, who, through a series of events, steadily and slowly become each other's worst enemies. And so you're rooting for all of them as they're doing worse things to each other. Um, it's it's tricky, but it can be done. Always think of this as a lens to view your story through. Um, because if you think of it as a set of rules, you'll get frustrated, you'll throw it away, you'll say, this isn't the way I want to tell the story. And the way you want to tell the story is the only thing that matters. This is just a tool to help you. Anything else? Yeah. Um, from what you said, I'm assuming that one of your own endings might have been challenging to write. Every one of them. <laughs> Get there? Yeah. Uh, I mentioned the bourbon, right? <laughs> yeah. um, it's, really, it's really hard, and it's, uh, it's a bit mysterious. You know, it, it's a matter of, for me, structure helped enormously because I could look at this as a roadmap and say, OK, well, where was I going with all of this? In what ways did my characters fail? they need to find a way to redeem themselves in third act. And part of the time when endings feel tacked on, it's because it wraps up the external plot, but it doesn't wrap up the internal plot, the way the characters were changing or the things they needed to learn. Uh, and there are many great books written uh, where people don't grow and change, and that's okay too. But if you're writing one where they do, make sure that that's part of it. I always try to go back to a character to make sure that I'm not moving them around like chess pieces on a board. Um, I do have a pet peeve where you'll hear writers talking about how their characters talk to them. Um, in my personal opinion, if your character is talking to you, you should adjust your dosage. Uh, your character should not be speaking aloud. But I know what they mean. Um, and what they mean is that, especially towards an ending, you should know and feel these people. And if you're trying to make them do something because it would be convenient for you, but not accurate to them, that's oftentimes when you're heading in a wrong direction. As far as how to actually get there, God, honestly, I do a lot of free writing. I do a lot of pacing. Uh, I work with a writing partner, which I highly recommend. Uh, I, we don't actually write together. We talk together. We're on the phone um, three times a week for three hours a week. We're like teenage girls. Um, but it's, uh, it's so useful to have someone else to talk about it because when you're writing, it's not forest for the trees, man. You're at the bark. Like you, You're right here. And so having someone who isn't and who understands story, and it needs to be someone who understands this stuff, is enormously helpful. So that's a tip I would throw out. Yes? Do you use an outline when you write? Or do you use Loosely, and this is, uh, this is it. Um, I, I know what I call the major beats in the three-act structure, um, which is actually probably a beautifully provided transition for me to move into the major beats um, that I think will help you. But in Act One, I'm not going to write on these because it's going to get awkward. But you see that each of these, first of all, there's forward motion on all of them. It's to give you the idea of forward motion. There's a certain number of scenes. It's no magical number. It's all variable that run through. But say your book is around 350, 400 pages. Act one is likely around 75 pages. You know, this again, it's I, my book, Brilliance, act one, it's a 450-page book, and act one ends at page 143, um, which was not my plan, but I think works OK. Loose guideline. Act one is where you're setting things up. Um, by the way, I use and borrow liberally from a book called Save the Cat. Uh, it's a, actually a book on screenwriting, but it's the book that cracked it open for me. And if you want more information and 
I was seriously beautiful, tactical, hands dirty explanation. It's great, even if you're not a screenwriter. Um, save the cat. It, it, save the cat is a term he, it's by an author named Blake Snyder, um, is a term he uses for early on having a protagonist do something nice so that we like him. Um, he saves the cat who's out on the ledge. It's, you know, it's that sort of vibe. And once you start reading books like this and start thinking in terms of three-act structure, you're going to see it everywhere. That's another thing about really learning to write and learning these as tools. You are going to completely screw your enjoyment of most <laughs> fiction and movies. You just really are. The, the books that take me away now, it's maybe one in a year, and I read a lot of books. Um, when I was a kid, the side of the cereal box would take me away. You know, but that's, that's the cost. Um, that's just the cost. You're learning these tools. Got to do it. Excuse me. So I borrow heavily from his work, so I'm crediting it. Um, but his is definitely aimed at screenwriting, which is a more rigid format. Uh, and so I'm taking just the things that I think are most helpful for novelists. Uh, and I would suspect, although I've never really done book length creative nonfiction, I think it would probably be very useful for you guys as well. So within Act One, one of the things that I like, it's more important in movies, but I think it's very strong with books too, is an opening image. And the opening image, if you think about Star Wars, uh, putting aside the scroll where it explains the story, the opening image is space and that big, freaking, unbelievable, we'd never seen anything like it before, ship flying over the camera, chasing another ship. And we are in, man. Not only that, we know a lot about what the movie's going to be about. Not only that it's going to be a, a space opera and that it's going to kind of blow our minds, especially at the time, but there's a big Goliath of a ship chasing a little tiny David that has no chance. And that's the movie right there. I mean, that's the whole series in one shot, if you choose to represent it. Don't kill yourself looking for it. Don't not write a book because you can't figure out the opening image. But as you're writing, think about it. Think about what is your story really about. And is there a way that you can work that in? It doesn't need to be the first page at all. Is there a way you can work that in early? Something that kind of cues us subconsciously, this is the essence of the story in one scene. Something to think about, like I said, never let any of this stop you from writing. It's a tool to help you write. That happens fairly early, the opening image. Um, also, generally fairly early, you meet the protagonist. Uh, it is, in my humble opinion, a bad idea to delay meeting the protagonist very long. There's nothing wrong with meeting a group that sets up a story um, or meeting a killer and his victim, but if we're not meeting the protagonist till page 70, um, it's pretty hard for us to get invested because we got invested in somebody else and then you yank the rug out from underneath us. And you, there are times you want to yank the rug out from underneath your audience, but not with who they're supposed to care about. That's, that's tough. Fairly early in Act One also uh, is what in screenwriting terms is called a catalyst. Catalyst uh, or an inciting event. And it's, it's the thing that sets things in motion. You know, It's what gets it going. Um, in Star Wars, the catalyst is when they buy the droids, you know, Luke, Luke farm boy, whiny boy Luke, um, and his uncle buy the droids that have been on the run. And he's cleaning them and he sees this message from Princess Leia, which he, he's dreamed about being in the rebellion, but he doesn't know, he's a farm boy. And all of a sudden he's in possession of something that seems really meaningful. And more than that, something is, in him has been stirred. Uh, something in him wants to move forward. Great catalyst, doesn't have to be that clear. But there's usually something that sets this in motion. Oftentimes, you were talking about a classic mystery. Maybe it's the detective arriving on the scene and learning it, but more likely it's the detective arriving on the scene and learning it's his sister. Uh, it's the thing that gives you a little extra juice, that takes this out of the everyday and starts to set your protagonist on a journey. Making sense? All right. Um, that all leads into the break into two, which is the end of act one, uh, but it's distinct. It's the break into act two, and that is when we are moving on to our journey. We are going. It's important. It needs to be a moment. It needs to be defined, and in my opinion, it needs to be the protagonist choosing to do it. If, if Luke Skywalker had been knocked out and woke up on the Millennium Falcon and oh gosh, now he's on an adventure, it loses so much juice. 
They need to choose to do this thing because you're going to beat the living crap out of them later so they can regret that choice. In, uh, in Star Wars, the break into two is not, you know, with the sand people when he gets beaten up and it's not on the canteen. The break into two is when he arrives back at his homestead and finds his uncle and aunt murdered. He's got nowhere to go, but he chooses to, talk, to say to Obi-Wan Kenobi, I want to go with you. Basically, I want to get payback. Um, and that choice propels the whole series. All making sense? All right, sweet. So now we're in Act 2, which is really the story. Like I said, page count, pretty rough. 50 to 100 pages, probably. Um, Act 2 is where things really happen. It's where we explore your idea. It's where we see your, your protagonist begin to grow and change. Um, and eventually, it's where things get worse. The first part of Act 2 is often the most fun. It's the most fun to write. It's the most fun to read. Blake Snyder, the author of that book, calls it Fun and Games. And it's a really apt title. And for a lot of people who just start out writing a novel um, and not knowing structure, they get to this part and they're having a ball. And they think they've got it down. This writing thing is easy. I'm not saying those parts are easy. And I'm not saying they're exactly wrong. But this is the part where you're having fun with it. You know, Luke isn't just off for payback. He's also going to the cantina and meeting all these other alien species and this weird hotshot pilot who's arrogant but kind of a hero figure. And he's training in the force and getting shot in the ass by the little floaty droid. And it's, it's all of those where you are starting to explore your world. You're putting your character through a series of changes during which that character is moving towards what they think their goal is. They may be wrong about their goal. They may not. But it's where they think their goal is. Act 2A, especially the early part, is so much fun. Yes? When does the reader want to know what's at stake for the protagonist? When does that, when does that need to be? Uh, I think stakes should be introduced as early as possible. And then I think they should be steadily and consistently raised throughout. So using Star Wars, and it's just easier because everybody knows that. Um, stakes are pretty big already. You know, the only parental figures you had are, were murdered by an evil empire that you hate anyway. And at the same time, you really wanted to be out there fighting them and living a glamorous life. So you got some stakes and in the dark part of your mind, a bit of a reward. You wanted this. Um, that's the start of the stakes. But as things go up steadily throughout the movie, those stakes get higher and higher and planets are at, st at stake and his life and his honor and his beliefs are at stake. But I, I think without stakes, chances are you're writing a very boring book. Doesn't need to be a thriller. If I go back to that example of a, an estranged son trying to talk to his father, trying to build their relationship, there are stakes there. I mean, that, it doesn't need to be dead bodies for there to be stakes. It just needs to matter to your character. Yeah? I think so. I mean, I think as, yeah, there's, there's no reason that wouldn't necessarily. Um, there's nothing wrong with putting them up against a wall. They just have to still make a choice to go on this journey. You know, I, I think that personal commitment is really important because later you're going to pound them so much that they need to have chosen this. No one wants to read a story about someone who just kind of got dragged along and then got the heck beaten out of them for 300 pages. That's not, that's not fun. That's, that's torture porn. I, I, people do want to watch it. I don't understand torture porn, but whatever. So, uh, someone else? Yeah. Okay. With uh, Joseph Campbell, the, the, the hero, hero with a thousand faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the hero's journey. Christopher Vogler. Would, would, would the, be very good also too? Or what would Those are also both very good books. He's referring to uh, two books um, Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is a uh, sociological, anthropological examination of hero myths throughout different cultures. And then a book by a guy named Christopher Vogler called The Writer's Journey, which took Campbell's work and turned it into a system for writing. Um, when I say three-act structure isn't a formula, it's important because Vogler's kind of is, and it's the reason all 80s movies are the same. 
Uh, when he wrote that, it let Hollywood up. The introduction's about 10 pages, and it got passed all around Hollywood, and every screenplay was written to it, and that's why they're all the same. Great resources, great resources. Read them, learn from them, take, learn from everybody. Um, but to me, 3X structure is a little more primal and a little less formulaic. Yes? Um, this is getting away from structure, but... Um, no! <laughs> I write in whichever will better serve the story, which sounds like a dodge, but is a very honest answer. Um, there is no right or wrong to that. Uh, it's the advantage to third person is that you can slip things in while being close to the person. You can slip things in that aren't expressly in their head. Um, you can also, uh, I call it um, being able to position the camera. If you're writing in third person, you can write from multiple third person points of view, so we can always be looking at the most interesting things. Me personally, most of the time, I find third person more to my liking, but that's just more to my liking. First person is great, it's an automatic intimacy, um, and so you get this big charge up front where you, your reader is likely much more tied to your, to your character. The crippling thing is, we can't know anything your character doesn't know. We can't see anything your character doesn't see. It's why PI fiction um, always is so labyrinthine with them going around to talk to a million people who don't seem like they matter, because it's the only way for us to, he's got to hear it from somebody, you know? Philip Marlowe's got to hear it from somebody. Uh, so there's no right or wrong. Just depends what you're trying to do. Yes? I am. I am a full-time writer. Can you pay your bills? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very salient point. <laughs> my wife does not work. I am very fortunate. I have been a full-time writer supporting uh, my family since 2007. Um, and I'm very lucky in that. Uh, but when I tell you about these tools and the importance of them, understand that this isn't me talking about a hobby. This is how I pay my mortgage. This is how I know that my daughter's gonna go to college. I'm not just sitting up here bullshitting at you. Um, I'm not saying understanding them will make it happen, but it will certainly make it easier. And I use these every day of my life. So to get back to structure, if I may, um, another thing that happens in early act two, in act two A, is oftentimes the introduction of a B story. I don't want to dwell on it too much because it's particularly a cinematic term, but a B story is, is the part of the story that isn't directly driving towards the solution, but came about through it. It's usually the, you know, in movies, it's oftentimes the love story. The person's trying to save the world, but hey, she's really cute. Um, and it's a nice way to break things up. It's worth thinking about in the context of your novel is can you bring in a B story just to give yourself more tools so that a cliffhanger can then not flow directly into the result but get sidetracked. It's just another tool, it's not mandatory. So I've used them, I've not used them. If you do use them, please, if there's a nuclear bomb under Manhattan, don't stop to have the characters make out. That just <laughs> bugs me. There's a bomb, we'll make out later. <laughs> Uh, then we reach, at the end of 2A, the midpoint, which is one of the most important and most challenging parts of the book. And it's the thing that really throws people off in trying to understand 3 x structure. It's also, when I refer to the page 200 desert, it's probably the reason you're stuck there. I learned about structure, God, I'd written four books before I really got it. Um, and so it was my fifth and sixth novel that I had it. In the previous four books, when I hit page 200 or thereabouts, I had a month-long period of intense self-loathing um, that just went nowhere before I finally would fumble my way through it. Once I learned structure, both of the last two books, I'm not gonna say they were easy, but I knew it was coming, I knew what to do, I knew why I'd been having the trouble, and I could just bridge through it. So the midpoint, which does not need to be the exact middle of your book, by any means, somewhere around there probably, is the moment when the story takes a dramatic turn. Oftentimes, it's when we realize that the story we thought we were watching is not the story we're watching. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. 
but it can be. It's just something where it goes dramatically left, and it's at least partly as a result of our character's actions. It is also the moment where things start to really go wrong. The fun and games of 2A, where we've been out learning about our universe and playing in our story, are starting to give way to the dark side of there's consequences to these actions. The midpoint in Star Wars is an easy one to miss because you don't, it, it's, sometimes there's a dramatic event where there's a midpoint and sometimes there's not. But the midpoint in Star Wars takes place on the Death Star. It's before Ben Kenobi dies and it's basically, they've been doing pretty well. Yeah, we had the garbage compactor, but we got away and there was some laughing and some banter. But they're all split up. They're all in different places. The ship is locked down. Great, you got her out. You're in the middle of an enemy fortress. Good luck with that. Um, that moment is the midpoint because it's at that point that we realize everything is about to go in a different direction. And that is quickly followed up by the beginning of Act 2B, and this is most of Act 2B, bad guys close in, Blake Snyder turn. Bad guys close in. This is where we learn there are consequences for our actions. Every book is a morality story on some level. There are consequences for our actions. So we're looking out the window. We kind of get a plan of what's going to happen. The only way it happens is that Obi-Wan Kenobi draws attention by wandering over in front of Darth Vader and saying, hi, Darth. Um, and everyone draws so they can get away, and that's great. But the bad guys are closing in. This thing that was an, a lark, an, an adventure for a farm boy who always wanted to see the galaxy, now his father figure gets cut down right in front of him. Right in front of him, and there's nothing he can do. He's dragged on board a ship. Yeah? Five. Five. Wow. I am babbling. Um, he's dragged on board a ship. They escape, but of course they're chased. They deal with the pursuers. That seems easy enough. But of course he's really torn up about Obi-Wan Kenobi. But the bad guys are closing in. They were allowed to escape because there's a tracking device and it's leading them directly to the rebel base. So by their actions, their seemingly heroic actions, they've screwed it up for everybody. Everybody. And that leads into your all is lost moment. That's the moment when it's just so wrong. It's everything is wrong. We brought the Death Star to the headquarters of the rebellion, this tiny little nascent group that can't possibly fight this massive empire. The, we don't even know how to hurt the thing. But, you know, the, Han Solo is ready to leave. The group is falling apart. This team spirit is ending. It's the all is lost, dark moment. Which leads into the break into three, uh, which is the moment that despite all is lost, all being lost, they find a way to fix it. Usually, in fact, always, if it's effective, the protagonist is central to that. So they analyze the plans and they see that there's a weakness in the Death Star and that's great. But the chance of hitting that weakness is pretty much nil and you got two minutes to do it uh, or they're gonna blow up the planet. And by the way, Darth Vader's up there flying around so have a good time, kids. Um, and we're thrown into three. Act three, get them down out of the tree. It's the easiest of all three acts. It's hard to figure out what you want to do, how to get there. That part is agonizing. Once you figure it out, act three is great. Act three is fairly simple. You gotta tie things up. You gotta put in as much passion and personal revelation as possible, keeping the stakes high. You gotta make it look like there is no way they can succeed, and then they succeed, somehow. Again, it doesn't have to be a happy ending. And that's, uh, and that's pretty much it. That's how it works. I didn't realize I'd run on quite this long, but I, let's take some questions on this or on anything else. Um, first of all, does everybody feel like they kinda got how this works? Good. Use it, don't use it, really doesn't matter. But knowing it will help you enormously. You find yourself having a problem with something, look at your structure. Even if you didn't use it in planning, break this out and say, where is my midpoint? You know, where is my break into two? Are the fun and games in the right place? Yes, sir. Now that some of your stories are going into development, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if someone else is doing it, what are you finding out if they're not doing it right? Uh, it's a good question. He asked about my, my films, my books that are being translated into film, which is a very surreal experience. Um, my third novel, Good People, actually starts shooting in a month with uh, James Franco and Kate Hudson, 
which is a lot of fun. So I keep getting Google alerts about James Franco. Um, and my novel, Brilliance, which comes out in July, uh, sold in an auction, a pretty dramatic day, um, to Legendary Pictures, which did the Batman series and Inception and uh, Watchmen. And they are very serious about moving forward with it. So it's something I'm invested in personally. Um, I do not adapt them. I'd love to adapt somebody else's. I'd love to write an original screenplay. I don't know about adapting my own work, to be honest. It's, um, it's a little bit like surgery on your own children. Uh, a, a novel's 400 pages, a screenplay is 110. You have to have an incredible ruthlessness. One character needs to serve the needs of three. You gotta cut out scenes that seem central to you as a novel. So me personally, I, I haven't had the balls to do it. Um, watching somebody else do it is a really strange experience. It's the only time you will ever read your story and not know what's gonna happen on the next page. <laughs> Which is kinda cool. And that's it. Hey, guys, thank you so much. I'm around all weekend, so, you know.